All right, as we get started today, I want to invite everyone. So that means everyone over here in the section to my left, everyone here in the middle, everyone over here on my right, everyone who's up there hiding in the balcony, and all of our friends online, I want to invite everyone to join me in celebration. You see, if I've got a little glow about me this weekend, if there's maybe a little more bounce in my step, if my smile's a little bigger than normal, it's because on Friday, my wife Corigwin and I celebrated 22 years of marriage. That's right, we met 23 years ago in a beautiful botanical garden just outside Gainesville, Florida. My roommate from college and her roommate from college met each other in grad school and we met at their wedding. We were both part of the wedding party, but here's the thing. Out of all the people in the wedding party, we were the only two that the bride and groom didn't try to set up, right? Now, they had a thousand reasons why. The first 999 had something to do with me, and the thousandth had something to do with Corigwin being engaged to another dude. <laughs> but at the end of the day, like literally, by the end of that first day, I'd won. I got the girl, and here we are, 23 years later, going strong, madly in love, celebrating 22 years of marriage. <laughs> to be honest, though, there were some years in there we weren't sure we were going to make it. Years when I refused to bend down and pick up something in the driveway for fear she'd run me over with the car. <laughs> like most couples, through the years, we've had our share of hardships and difficulties. But there's one night, one night in particular that we both point to as the worst night in our marriage. We call it the night of the suitcase. All right? We were about 10 years in. And though we were happy more often than not, and though we loved each other more than anything, in those 10 years, we had managed to hurt each other more times than we could count. Mostly unintentionally, mostly small stuff, but that small stuff has a way of adding up, creating space, making you feel numb inside. And so by the night of the suitcase, we were both feeling pretty dead internally. And the truth is, we were trying to figure out whether or not we should just let the relationship die. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about what all our issues were, because I've been married 22 years, and I'm smarter than that, right? <laughs> but suffice to say, we'd reached our limit. We were both powder kegs of emotion, and that night, one conversation lit the fuse, and the explosion was ugly. Right? We, it felt like it came out of nowhere, but we both knew that wasn't the case. You see, in that moment, years of hurt, all the sadness, all the disappointment, all the hurt, all the missed expectations, all the stray words, all the things that we had stored away for years came spilling out. And Corigwin told me that for a few weeks, she'd been thinking about, maybe even fantasizing about, the end. And hearing that made something snap inside me. And I ended up saying some things that I will never be able to unsay. And then I stormed upstairs. And in a rage, I went into our closet and I began grabbing clothes off the, off the hangers and just throwing them onto the floor. And I, I grabbed at a suitcase because here's the thing. I was going to show her. She wasn't going to leave me. I was going to leave her. I was going to drive the final nail in the coffin. But God had other plans. And God has a great sense of humor. Because that suitcase that I grabbed, that suitcase that had served us so well for so many years, the same suitcase that has served us well ever since, for some reason that night, the zipper didn't work. <laughs> it wouldn't budge. And I was too dumb to grab another suitcase. So I just slammed that one down and sank to the floor in a puddle of emotion. Anger, betrayal, sadness, fear, confusion. But worst of all was the crushing weight I felt as I realized what I'd almost let die, what I'd been killing for years. So after a little while, I finally gathered myself, I swallowed my pride, and I walked back downstairs. A lot of us have been there, right? Others of us may be heading there right now. So Today I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how we got there, 
right, how two people who met and fell in love in a beautiful garden messed things up so bad that our marriage almost wilted and died. I want to talk a little bit about that, but more so I want to talk about how we got here, how two people who hurt each other so much, so deeply, so often got to celebrate 22 years of marriage on Friday. Because here's the thing, if I came out here today and said, 12 years ago, I walked out on my marriage. This room would fill with a, a strange kind of sadness, right? You'd look back at me with everything from empathy to anger. But because I can say 22 years, you smile and you clap and you cheer because we're hardwired to want relationships to thrive and succeed. And yeah, I'm coming at this from the context of marriage, but it's true of all relationships. Whatever the relationship, father, daughter, brother, sister, neighbor, coworker, friend, you name it, whatever the relationship, if it's functioning well, it brings life to the people in it, and it points people to God by being a reflection of how Father, Son, and Spirit have lived together throughout eternity. And because relationships have that kind of power, the power to bring life to us and, and glory to God, Satan wants to kill them. You see, the Bible says that Satan is like a roaring lion, roaming about seeing who he can devour. In another place, it says that he's like a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Satan wants to destroy our relationships. That's a win in his book. But here's the thing about Satan. Cunning as he is, wise as he is, his playbook, his game plan for destruction, it's crazy simple. In fact, here you go. I'm going to give you his entire game plan in one sentence. Satan tries to destroy relationships by causing division. Division is his go-to play. Now, he has multiple variations on this play, and that's what we're going to talk about over the next several weeks. Each week, Jesus is going to expose some version of this play. He's going to show us one of the ways that Satan tries to cut us off from the people who bring us life. But then Jesus is going to give us the game plan for defeating it. And every week, he's going to say almost the same thing. He's going to say, don't get so distracted by the big things that you miss out on the small things. You see, because Satan very rarely tries to destroy our relationships with the big stuff, right? We can see the big stuff coming a mile away. No, Satan creates division slowly, subtly, over time. You see, he starts out small with things that we just chalk up to the human condition, right? Things we give ourselves a pass on, things that are so normal that we don't even give it a thought. Because Satan knows that that little stuff if it goes unchecked, if it gets dismissed, if it gets overlooked, eventually, over time, it leads to and becomes the big stuff. So Jesus, each week, is going to say to us, hey, you've heard it said, look out for the big things like murder, adultery, and so on. Say, but I say to you, those aren't the only things you got to watch out for. you got to keep your eye on the little stuff, the, the hidden stuff, the stuff behind the stuff, because that's the things that are doing the most damage. In fact, today in Matthew 5, verses 21 through 26, Jesus is going to say to us, hey, murder is really bad, but anger is what's killing you. Look with me, if you will, at verse 21. Jesus says, you have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. Jesus starts out with, murder's bad, don't do it, right? Which we can all agree on, right? In fact, turn to somebody next to you and ask them. Is murder bad? Okay, if anybody responds with anything other than an immediate yes, if they feel the need to clarify in any way, feel free to politely excuse yourself and move to another section of the auditorium. Right? And for our friends watching online, if your person didn't say yes, call 911. Right? <laughs> Seriously, it's strange, isn't it, how in our culture something huge like murder has become the dividing line between good people and bad people. Think about it. We get caught doing something wrong. What's our response? It's not like I killed anybody. <laughs> but in this passage, Jesus says, it kind of is. Look with me at verse 22. It says, but I say, if you were even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. In verse 21, it's if you murder someone, you're subject to judgment. In verse 22, it's if you're even angry with them, you're subject to judgment. So Jesus says the penalty for anger and murder should be the same. And that feels a little off, right? Because after all, like, murder is an action. It's something we do to someone. 
Whereas anger is an emotion. It's something we feel towards someone. And what's more, murder is a choice, right? I choose to kill someone. But anger is a response, right? If I kill someone, it's me who's doing it. So it makes sense that I should be the one who pays the price. But it's other people who make me mad, right? They're the ones who are doing it. So shouldn't they be the ones who pay the penalty? Not according to Jesus. You see, Jesus is exposing Satan's playbook. He's showing us the stuff behind the stuff. So Jesus says anger is murder, and murder is anger. In other words, every misunderstanding, every stray word, every joke gone bad, every sentence taken out of context, everything they do that has the potential to tick you off is something that may make you a murderer. Jesus continues. He says, uh, if you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. Now, something we need to understand as we work our way through Jesus' teachings over the next several weeks is that Jesus didn't speak English, right? His words were originally written down in Greek. So sometimes our modern day translators have difficulty finding an exact uh, replacement for a word in Greek, and they have to do the best they can, and so in this case, they came up with idiot. But the word here is actually raka. Let me hear you say raka. Now, this is a word you gotta say with some energy, some passion, raka. All right, now, nobody knows exactly what raka meant, right? All we know is it was like a really, really bad word, maybe the worst word that you could say. So a lot of you just cussed in church. Just, just saying. Between you and God, gotta figure that one out, but you know, nobody really knows what it meant, but here's what we do know. It was less a word and more an attempt at giving sound to what happens in your throat when you hock a loogie, right? When you spit, right? It's that raka as you bring it up, raka. So raka is when you're spitting mad, right? You lose it for a second, everything goes red. And in that instant, you want nothing to do with the other person. Anybody ever been there? Yeah, Jesus says you might be a murderer. He continues, and if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. He says, if you curse someone, if you slander or gossip about or do anything to drive a wedge between a person and their community, you are in danger of the fires of hell. This is scary, right? Because we've all done this stuff, right? It's like Jesus is saying, we're all murderers. It's kind of like, it's like those Jeff Foxworthy jokes, right? The redneck ones where he'd be like, hey, if such and such is true about you, you might be a redneck. It's like Jesus is saying, hey, if you ever let loose with a slew of angry words, or if you ever gave the one finger wave in traffic, or if you ever hoped something really bad happened so your mother-in-law would have to go home a day or two early, you might be a murderer. And Jesus says, hey, your anger, the way you're responding to hurts and wounds and offenses, it's killing you and your relationships. He says, your anger is putting you in danger of the fires of Gehenna. You see, Jesus doesn't actually say hell in this verse. He says Gehenna. And Gehenna was this little place just outside of Jerusalem. And through the centuries, it was used for all sorts of different purposes. But by the time of Jesus, it was a garbage dump where people would go to burn their trash. So Jesus says that when we let anger, contempt, bitterness simmer and boil, our relationships begin to stink. And that was definitely the case with Kerygwin and me. See, we had met and fallen in love in a beautiful garden. But by the night of the suitcase, our marriage smelled like rotting fruit and burning trash. And there I was, in our closet, clothes on the floor, suitcase in hand, ready to walk out and let the relationship die. And here's the thing. It was no one big thing that got us there. Instead, it was dozens upon dozens of little things that through the years we allowed to fill the suitcase of our heart. Things like stray words. And missed expectations. And emotional slights. Just small stuff. From the outside looking in, we had it all together. We had what everybody wanted, but behind the scenes, we were killing each other in a dozen different ways. 
You see, we had started off as this amazing team with this beautiful shared vision of what our life would be. But as all those little slights began to pile up one after the other, this gap, this chasm began to grow between us, and it just got easier and easier to pack our bags. And here's the thing. We never once thought of killing the other one. Right, babe? Uh, <laughs> Seriously, we, we never once thought of killing each other. We didn't want to hurt each other. We were each other's best friends. We loved each other more than anything. So rather than lashing out when the things got tough, we just kept packing more and more away in our suitcase. So when life got tough and we began feeling misunderstood or forgotten or taken for granted, over and over, we would just pack it away in the suitcase of our heart because we didn't want to hurt the other one. We wanted to take it ourselves. The problem is eventually the suitcase got full. And then it became a little bit easier to cast blame. Or to point the finger. Or sometimes just say nothing at all. Anybody ever been there? Man, we had fallen into Satan's trap. He was destroying our relationship by causing distance and division. And the whole time he was whispering in our ear, you don't have to put up with this. You deserve better. You just cut your losses, pack your bags, let the relationship die. <laughs> but Jesus had better things in mind. Jesus made the zipper stick. And when he did... Here's what he said to me, pursue her, pursue her. See, that's what Jesus says to all of us, no matter what kind of relationship we're in, no matter what struggles we're having, Jesus says, pursue. Look with me at verse 23. Jesus says, so if you are presenting a sacrifice, he says so. He says, hey, since this is how things are, since Satan's playbook seems to be working, since your relationships are slowly dying, let me tell you how to resurrect what's dead and dying between you. And then he says this, and I absolutely love what Jesus says next. He says, so if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Jesus says, if you suddenly remember. Now think about this for a second. We don't have to suddenly remember we murdered somebody. Right? We don't have to suddenly remember the big stuff. We suddenly remember the small stuff. Right? The stray word, that, that uh, sentence that we took out of context, the joke gone bad. So Jesus says, hey, keep your eyes out for the small stuff. That thing that in the moment didn't feel like that big of a deal, but later on in the day you're like, ooh, I bet that stung. Right? And it doesn't matter if it was intentional or not. You see, that small stuff adds up. And over time, if you drop enough trash in your garden... It turns into a dump. So Jesus says, hey, if you suddenly remember even the slightest thing you've done to hurt somebody else, drop everything and make it right. Now Jesus said this to a group of peasants and farmers and fishermen on a hillside in Galilee some 80 miles from the temple in Jerusalem. These are people with no PTO, no vacation time, no cars, no carriages, no horses. And Jesus says to them, hey, when you take some time off work without pay, and you scrounge up what little supplies you have for this three, maybe four day journey, when you risk your life by going through the hills and taking a chance on being robbed or, or injured, and you finally arrive in Jerusalem, and you make your way up the Temple Mount, and you stand in line all day long, and you finally arrive at the altar, and then suddenly remember a stray word that you said to a neighbor on your way out of town, drop everything, Go back down the Temple Mount and begin the long journey home to say you're sorry. This would be like somebody living in Mesquite, huge Golden Knights fan. And she has the opportunity to go to Game 7 of the Stanley Cup. Now, she's going to have to take time off work without pay. And she has no car, so she's going to have to walk to get there. But she doesn't care. This is a chance to see her beloved Knights win it all. So she packs a bag and she throws it over her shoulder and she begins making the journey through the desert. 
And after three or four days of braving coyotes and snakes and people who would do her harm, she finally arrives into Sheba Plaza. And she's just mesmerized by the lights all around her. She's taking in the smells and the sounds, and she's holding on to her ticket for dear life as she goes through the line, and she makes her way through security, and then she gets in the atrium, and she rides the escalator up to the side, and she goes to a concession stand where she spends money she doesn't have on a $10 hot dog and an $18 beer because she doesn't want to miss out on anything in this experience. And so she finds her way to her seat, and as she does, she can sense the excitement of the crowd, and she feels it welling in her chest as the national anthem is played. But then, just as the puck is about to drop, she suddenly remembers a crossword that she said to a Sharks fan back in Mesquite. So she sets down her hot dog, she hands the person next to her a beer, she makes her way down the escalator and out into the plaza, all the while hearing the roar of the crowd, as she begins her long journey back to say she's sorry. This is radical, costly, absurd behavior. I mean, come on, a crossword to a Sharks fan? Like, is that really that big a deal? Like, couldn't it wait till after game seven? Jesus says no. He says your priority needs to be maintaining, nurturing, and deepening your relationships. He says this is where life and relationship is found. And this was a radical departure from the teaching of his day. You see, these people could afford maybe, like maybe one time a year, they could afford to make this trip to Jerusalem. So it was special. It was sacred. This was a celebration. This was their opportunity to worship and pursue God. And that's way more important than just going back and saying you're sorry to some person who may not even remember the thing that you did or the thing you said, right? That's what religion tells us. Religion says this is about you and God. But Jesus says, oh no, this is about you and me, and you and her, and you and them, and you and us, and you and y'all, and you and anybody and everybody, because we're all God's kids. So Jesus says, you better get really serious about getting right with my kids before you try to tell anybody that you're right with me. It's Father's Day. So dad, you tell me how you see this going down. Right? How do you feel about somebody who wants to be real tight with you, but they want to treat your kids like garbage. Right? You're gonna be good sharing a meal with some guy who hurt your little girl and didn't bother to make it right? But what about the flip side of that? How are you gonna feel about the dude who drives 80 miles out of his way to knock on your door so he can say sorry to your son for the things that he shouted at the soccer game? See, Jesus calls for radical reconciliation. He says to the people in the crowd, he's like, I don't care about time, cost, or inconvenience. If you suddenly remember even the slightest thing that you have done to hurt another person, I want you to drop everything, leave the temple, journey home, and make it right. Woo. Can you imagine what Canyon Ridge would look like this morning if everyone who in the last 10 or 15 minutes has suddenly remembered something they've done to somebody, else, all those people got up, hopped in their cars, and drove away to make it right. I don't know what it would look like today, but I get goosebumps thinking about what it would look like next week and the week after that and the week after that because people would be flocking to this place. And more importantly, they'd be flocking to Jesus. We'd be seeing people getting baptized left and right. All those friends who you've been inviting for years, they'd show up because they'd be like, something is different there. All of our serving and our giving and our worship, it would take on a whole new feel. It would go to a whole new level because there'd be greater integrity and greater passion and greater gratitude in it. Jesus says, when you're in the wrong, drop everything and make it right. And that alone would be enough to revolutionize our lives and our relationships, but Jesus isn't done. Look at verse 25. He says, when you're on your way to court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge, who will hand you over to an officer, and you will be thrown into prison. And if that happens, you surely won't be free again until you have paid the last penny. About 20 years ago, I was driving across the southern tier of New York State from Buffalo to Binghamton. And there are two different ways that you can do this. You can drive about 90% of the way on wide open interstates, or you can take this beautiful scenic uh, drive through rolling hills and these little bucolic towns. And, Normally, I would take the interstate. I was always in a hurry, but this day I had a little extra time, so on a whim, I said, you know what? I'm going to take the scenic route. 
So what that meant was I would intermittently go from these long stretches of 55 mile an hour speed limits to these short little spurts of 30 mile an hour speed limits when I would go through town. So I'm cruising along at a speed I feel good about. I'm going like 65, you know, so <laughs> speeding, but not really speeding, right? When all of a sudden, out of nowhere, from behind me, this dark green Saturn bursts over the hill and just shoots past me going like 85, 90 miles an hour. And then almost as quickly, I see brake lights, like hard brake lights. So I'm not at all surprised a second later when I get there and I see that there's a cop back in the trees with a radar gun. Well, about a quarter of a mile later, we hit one of those 30 mile an hour zones as we head into town. And I follow this dark green Saturn into town and watch him turn left onto a side street while I continue going straight through town in my dark green Honda Accord. Only to be uh, greeted on the other side of town by a different cop who said I had been clocked going 79 in a 55. I was like, sir, oh, I understand the mistake. It was a dark green Saturn. I'm driving a dark green Accord. You can understand. He did not understand. So he went ahead, he wrote me the ticket, and I, I went away. I was angry because I was in the right, and this didn't make sense, but what are you going to do, right? Well, three, maybe four weeks later, I get the official ticket in the mail. And with that official ticket is also the official report from the officer. And as soon as I read it, I knew I had him. Because the one with the radar gun said that he clocked an eastbound, dark green Saturn going 79 miles per hour. And I had my registration that said I drove a dark green Honda Accord. So I didn't care that it was two hours from my house. I disputed the ticket, I set the court date, and I went there expecting to be fully exonerated. But you'll remember how I said I drove through small town after small town? Yeah, well these were really small towns. You, you know the kind I'm talking about, the ones where everyone, including the cop and the judge, are related? <laughs> yeah. So I show up, and I, I've got my ducks in a row. Like, I, I'm showing up. I've got, I literally took pictures. I've got documentation. I'm going to win this case, right? I've got, in fact, I think they're going to write me an apology letter and give me gas money for the ride home, right? I am that confident in the case that I have. But then I round the corner into the courtroom, and here's what I see. The cop standing behind the bench with the judge, and they are leaning across it, talking to their sister, the court stenographer, about what they're going to have for dinner that night. Needless to say, I did not win the case. No. In fact, I spent more than I would have spent if I had just paid the ticket. But I was right. Right? I was right. And that's when we go to court, when we know we're right. If we think there's any chance that we're wrong, we try to settle out of court. But when we know we're right, when we've got a great case, we're like, lawyer up, buddy. Let's do this. So in verses 25 and 26, Jesus is talking to people who are in the right. You're the one who's been deeply offended. You're the one who's wounded. You don't have to suddenly remember anything because their offense is ever present before you. You ever been right? Like really, <laughs> you said always, that's awesome. <laughs> We're talking like so right that, that Google, Siri, and Alexa all say you're right. You ever been that kind of right? But in your rightness, other people find you kind of hard to be around. What if you, uh, instead of being so concerned about winning and proving yourself right, you became more interested in crossing lines and meeting people where they are? How much more life would you bring? Right? How much more freedom would you feel internally? See, Jesus says that when we hold on tightly to our rightness, to what we perceive to be justice, we just might find ourselves rotting away in a cell of loneliness and isolation. So he says in this passage, hey, rather than dying in a prison of pride, settle your differences quickly. Or more literally, what he says here is when you're on your way to court with your adversary, una on. Una on. This is another one of those Greek to English situations. What una on means is make friends with. He says, when you're on your way to court with your adversaries, make friends with them. I don't know about you, but when my brother and I were growing up, if my dad caught us fighting, he would, well, he didn't always stop us right away. Whenever he got to a good point where he thought one of us was about to really win, he would make a stop, shake hands, and say, I'm sorry. My mom got a little weird with it. My mom would be like, guys, I want you to hug it out and tell each other you love each other. 
You know, it's like, all I want for Christmas is my boys to get along, you know, that sort of stuff. Well, Jesus is like, hey, that's not a bad start. But I don't want you to just say the words. I don't want you to just go through the motions. I want you to walk away as friends. And the only way you can do that when you're right is to hold loosely to your pride and tightly to your friend. Now, on the night of the suitcase, the word I heard Jesus say was pursue. And I knew that in order for me to do that, I was going to have to swallow my pride and go back downstairs. I I had stormed upstairs earlier feeling fully justified in my anger. I felt like Kerrigwin's sins were far more egregious than mine. She had hurt me way more deeply. Her things were so much less forgivable. I'll be honest, today I feel very differently about all that. but, But that night, I knew I was right and she was wrong. But you know what? Jesus didn't care about that. And I shouldn't have cared about that. Because what mattered was the relationship. Because the relationship is where the power is. The power to bring life to people and glory to God. So who's right and who's wrong? Doesn't matter a whole lot to Jesus. In either case, he's going to call us to do the absurd. On the one hand, he's going to say, hey, if you suddenly remember even the slightest thing you've done to hurt another person, drop everything and go make it right. And on the other side, he's going to say, hey, if you've got the case of a lifetime, if you're holding all the cards, instead of using them, hold loosely to your pride and tightly to your friend. But this isn't just what Jesus said. This is what Jesus did. You see, Jesus left heaven to pursue us. He wanted us to experience life, more and better life than we ever dreamed possible. So he came and lived among us, and he showed us, and he taught us how to get the most out of life. And Jesus said that life is best lived in relationship. So he had no time for boundaries, for walls, for borders, for divisions. Instead, he crossed every line and met people where they were. And even though he never had to suddenly remember anything he had done to hurt another person or cause division, as he walked among us, Jesus was constantly being done wrong. He was misunderstood, he was misquoted, he was denied, he was despised, he was rejected, but he never held that against anyone. Instead, he constantly pursued. The one who was always in the right did not see his rightness as something to hold over us. Instead, he used his indisputably perfect life to wipe the slate clean for us. Jesus could have gone to the judge and made an amazing case against us, but instead, Jesus went before the judge and he made a case for us. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They don't know they're killing themselves. They just think they're angry. So God took all our hurts, all our insults, all our pain, all our offenses. He took everything that was killing us, everything that was dividing us, everything that was creating division between our relationship and him, and he hung it on the cross. And now Jesus is saying to us, do the same. Saying, think about that thing that was done to you and hang it on the cross. Consider that harsh word that was said to you and hang it on the cross. Look at all the things that are filling your suitcase, all the things that are making you want to leave and walk out on the relationship, and hang it on the cross. Jesus says, fix your eyes on me and let me set you free. In a moment, we're going to share communion together. We're going to take time to think about the sacrifice of Jesus and all that he went through to overcome Satan's plan for death and destruction and in order to give us life. And after that, we're going to sing a song together. We're trying to give a lot of space and a lot of room this morning for you to do exactly what Jesus said, to look into the suitcase of your heart, to consider all your hurt, all your pain, all the damage that's been done to you, and hang it on the cross. I'm going to encourage you to take inventory in these next few minutes. 
Think about the worst things that have been done to you and think about those smallest things that you've done to others. Take each and every one of them, hang them on the cross, and ask Jesus to set you free.